I want to set the stage. You're a middle school student. This is your first year going to middle school. So you've gone from having one teacher your whole entire day, and now you're going to have six or seven different teachers. You're going into your fourth class. You're sitting down and once again, the teacher is going over the school rules, the class rules, and it seems like you're hearing the same thing over and over again. You're just sitting there where the teacher talks about who they are, they talk about the class procedures, they talk about the rules of the class, and it's just, you're, you're done, you're tired, you're like, oh my gosh, this is just such a boring day. But what if it wasn't? What if instead you walked into your fourth class and on the table there were some interesting objects there and the teacher didn't go over the class rules and the teacher had you instead talking with the people around you, your fellow students, and they got you up and discussing and moving and having fun. Wouldn't you remember that teacher a lot more? Wouldn't you remember that class a lot more? Wouldn't you sit there and say, maybe this school is not going to be boring. Maybe this will be an exciting school year. And then you can go home and be like, oh my gosh, it was boring, but then something fun happened. Hi, I'm Christy. I'm a middle school science teacher with over 25 years experience in the classroom. And I love helping other teachers empower their students to take more ownership of their learning. So what we're talking about here is what to do during the first few days of school, maybe even the first week. And one thing that I love to do is to get my students up, moving, talking, engaging, and doing some type of activity. You see, I do not go over the rules my first day of school. In fact, I don't go over my classroom rules at all because I've been teaching middle school for 25 years. I know that at this point in a student's life that they've heard pretty much the exact same rules from kindergarten to first grade, second grade, third grade, and on. The rules might change a little bit, but most of us have the same rules. Be respectful. You know, many of us have the no chewing gum on campus or in the classroom. I mean, these are the same type of school rules as you go. So what I like to do is I just quickly ask my students, what are some normal school rules that you've heard or classroom rules that you've heard throughout your years? They tell me them, we write them down. I say, great. I don't have to talk about the rules because you already know them. And then we move on from there. Now, rules are different than procedures. Procedures are how your class flows. What makes it easier for you to transition? What are some expectations of your students as they come into your class, as they leave their class? You know, what are your expectations for when they're doing group work? So those are more procedures and they're not really rules. So I do teach procedures, but we'll get to that in a little bit. What I like to do my first day of school is do some team building activities. Now, some of these students are brand new maybe to the school. And so they're still trying to figure out and, and get to know other students that might come from a different elementary school or primary school. And they're all coming together now into their secondary school, their middle school or intermediate school, whatever. Um, whatever you call it uh, for what you're teaching. I like to have them doing a teamwork activity and I have lots of different ones that I use and it all depends on how, what grade my students are in. So luckily at my school, you know, we have worked together so we know, okay, which ones are gonna be used for seventh graders, which ones for eighth graders. I work at a seven, eight school, so we don't have sixth grade. Sixth grade is still considered um, elementary school in my district. So seventh graders, it's all about saving Sam or saving Fred. It's the same thing. You have that little gummy worm and you have that gummy lifesaver and they have to use the paper clips to, 
get that lifesaver around that worm before it falls into the ocean and drowns because the boat tips over, right? In eighth grade, we like to use the paper cups. And so I give them different challenges. They have the octopus, which is the rubber band, and it's attached to strings. So we have four strings and a rubber band, and they have to first unstack the cups and then stack them into a pyramid shape. And then from there, they can do for different sh challenges where they can line them up um, right side up and then take another one upside down on top of it. So you have lots of different activities that you can do with the paper cup challenge. Another one I like to do, there is one activity and it's a square and the square is divided up into different shapes. And the brilliance of this is that in one of the shapes is a small little square, which you can actually remove in the beginning and they can actually make a square with the other leftover pieces. And so I have my students make their square and I make it so that they can't talk to each other verbally with out loud, but they can use other communications to help them make the square. So they make the square and then I hand them that small little square piece and I say, you just got new evidence. Now make a new square because in science, as we get more information, our information about things change. And so I want them to get that idea also that it's always changing. Science is always changing, except for, of course, our laws and theories. But science is always really changing as we learn more information. I mean, think about, uh, I think about when I was growing, going through school and what we knew about space back then, you know, teaching about the planets and stars and galaxies. And what we know now, now that we have better technology and we can see farther and we can see more detail, right? So as we develop our technology, as we get new tools and more information, then our ideas can change. So we like, I like to do that the first day usually. During that first day, I also talk about only two procedures, how you come in, and how you exit, because I don't wanna overwhelm my students, right? Just giving them two procedures, how do you come in, how do you exit, and a fun, engaging, teamwork challenge activity for that class day. And that's it, and that's how we end it. Now on the second day, I want them thinking about growth mindset, right? Many kids, when they come in, uh, they have their own perception about certain subjects. They either love or they hate math. They love or they hate English. They love, they hate history. They love or hate science. And all this is based on previous perceptions of what they think about themselves and their ability to do things. So I want to talk about that and have them really start to analyze the evidence of what it is they, uh, have. So for example, if they're not into math, they hate math. They're always like, math is not, I'm not good at it. I, I, I can't do it. I like to have them look back at what they were able to do first grade, second grade, third grade, and what they're able to do now. Like looking at how challenging those, those parts were, like how challenging fractions were. But yet I guarantee you by the time they're in eighth grade, the third, a third grade tr fraction is not gonna be as difficult as it was back in third grade because they've practiced and practiced and practiced it, right? They've overcome their challenges. They failed and now they are succeeding. So I like to introduce famous failures and have my students look at different famous people that are successful in life or what we feel is successful, but look at what they had to overcome, looking at bankruptcy, uh, being told no, being rejected, being uh, going through all these different challenges. And so I like to have them look at these people who they feel are successful and all they see is the top success part, but they don't see all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that success, all the times those people failed. And so I like to do a famous failures activity with them, which involves them reading about different people. And I let them choose. I have about 16 different people that they can choose from. 
we watch a video about some of these people and about what it means to be successful and what it takes to be successful. How failing is part of the success path, that you have to actually go through failures, you have to actually fail a little bit in order to go on to bigger things, to challenge yourself, to you know, be successful, to hit that goal. And then I have them look at uh, what they have done in their lives, things that they failed at in the beginning, but now are successful in, even if it's just riding a bike. I mean, think about it when you rode a bike, how when you were riding a bike that, you know, you fail a lot, right? You had to have someone hold on to you at the beginning to help you with learn your balance. And it wasn't easy and it was challenging, but now you can ride your bike, no problem. Same thing with skateboarding, trying to figure out how to do different tricks on the skateboard takes practice and practice and practice and you multiple failures, multiple falls until you finally get that trick. Even playing the video games. We talk about the video games, how you're going to die many times um, before you actually become good at it. So we talk about that and that's where I want them to leave with the second day is this idea that yes, you are going to fail. In fact, in middle school, I tell them in middle school, their job in middle school is to fail and figure things out so that when they get to high school, they've learned how to communicate with multiple different teachers, how to um, plan their afternoons for studying with multiple different demands from different subjects and different teachers that have different ideas about homework and figure all that out and they're going to fail along the way and they're going to learn from it and be ready to go by the time high school hits, they'll understand how to manage different types of teachers and different expectations and different amount of work from different teachers. They'll figure that out so that they have it ready for high school. And I tell them that's their whole job is to challenge themselves, work through things, learn from it, and then you're ready to go for when you're into high school. So that's their job. And again, remember we talk about two procedures. So in this time, when we're doing this, I talk about the procedures of working with a group and also the procedures of getting materials and handing materials back. So again, we practice coming in and leaving from that I taught them the day before, and then I just throw on two more procedures with that. So that's my second day. Then we get into the third day and by now I want them doing science. I want them doing some type of science activity. We all know that writing scientific explanations are difficult for many students. Many students writing a claim evidence reasoning, they get confused with the evidence reasoning part. You know, their evidence really isn't evidence or their reasoning doesn't really link that evidence to the claim. And so what I love to do, and it's usually a two day activity, I like to get them into an introduction claim evidence reasoning activity where we are doing a crime scene investigation. So I set the stage and I have my students solving the crime of Sir Edward Berkshire III. And they come into class and they learn what happened uh, that Robert Dursley, the butler, came into Beckingham Manor on Sunday morning and he discovered Sir Edward Berkshire III on the floor in the dining room, blood by his head, mirror has been shattered, and he calls the police. So the police come over, they do their investigation, they interview the different um, people involved, like the chef, the butler, the maid, and his brother, and then they have to start figuring all this out. So they get actual incident reports, um, police reports with the photographs from the crime scene. They get the personal profiles of everyone that uh, is a possible suspect, uh, where they were during the supposed crime or during the incident, what motives they might have, then they get into the actual forensic information. So they're looking at the fingerprints, the blood type, the DNA. They look at the autopsy report and the toxicology report. And they're going through all this information and they're recording all their notes on their investigation journal. And then they have a great discussion about 
what they think actually happened to Sir Edward Berkshire III. Did he die of natural causes or is there foul play involved in this? So they have all that discussion. They then have to write their claim of what they think happened and they have to use evidence. And that's when I talk about how their evidence needs to be strong enough to be held up in a court of law where another piece of evidence couldn't bring in reasonable doubt to the jurors or to the judge. So they have that discussion and then their reasoning of why they think it happened and how they think it all played out. Um, and that's their reasoning. So they're using their evidence and then their reasoning is why they think it happened, how it all took place um, to give them that claim of what they think really happened. Uh, this is a fun activity. My students really love getting into it. In fact, every time they get a new piece of evidence, they're trying to figure out who did it, what actually happened to this person, uh, was it foul play or was it natural causes? And the discussions are wonderful and the students are fully engaged for two full days into science. And I love the fact that it also brings in forensics, which is a career choice they could actually move into a science career because forensics, you know, you're all, it's all about science there. So I'm bringing in extra career choices to get them interested in that, that maybe some of them will go on to become uh, forensics people uh, into that some type of field. Then on that Friday, that's when I have my students do their all about me information and I have them fill out some type of activity. I like to change it up every year. Sometimes I have them do a, a locker picture with all the stuff that that interests them. Sometimes they have a little scrapbook to do. Um, it all depends on how I'm feeling that year. Because remember, I've been teaching for 25 years. I have lots of introduction activity. One thing I do though, is I do have them fill out a Google form because I want to know more about them. I ask them what their preferred names are, what their preferred pronouns are. I ask them um, what name they go by at home, what pronouns they use at home, because for some of my students, it is different. And I need to know if I'm calling home, what name or pronouns do I use when I call home? That might be different than what I use in my own classroom. We get into technology, what they have and are able to use at home. Do they have a Chromebook? Do they need a hotspot? Do they need a Chromebook? Do they need help at doing technology at home? Or, you know, is it fine so I can get them the resources they need? We talk about um, interests because I want to know what interests are they into that I can maybe bring into one of our units later on. So I do do an informational survey that I have them fill out. It helps me get to know them. I give them information about myself on that, that Friday, and it's all about a get to know you Friday. So that's how we start our week. Again, it's teamwork on the first day, famous failure to second day. The next two days are done with claim evidence reasoning for CSI, and then it's all about me. That week gets us started. We have the weekend to get all our supplies ready to go. And then we start real science and all the standards the following week. Thank you for watching another Adventures in iSTEM and Beyond video. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications for more Adventures in iSTEM and Beyond videos. For more ideas on how to incorporate science, technology, and skills for life into your classroom, go to adventuresinistem.com.